Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Derek Stowell. I'm the immediate past president of the American Horticultural Therapy Association. Uh, and today we're going to do a, a talk about introduction of horticultural therapy uh, and talk a little bit about professional registration. Uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So once again, uh, just mute your um, <clears throat> mute your microphone and turn off your video during the presentation. Uh, and uh, questions you can ask in the chat, and I will get, I will answer those questions at the end of the session. Um, and then if we do run out of time, if you have any additional questions, uh, you can send those to info at aHta.org. So this session is also going to be recorded and we'll put it on our YouTube channel uh, for individuals that are uh, would like to watch it, go back and watch it again. So uh, before we begin our uh, meeting, I would like to uh, I would like to go ahead and uh, just thank our sponsors for 2022. Uh, those are Gothic Arts Greenhouses, Rector School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, Herbert College of Agriculture at the University of Tennessee, uh, and Horticultural Therapy Institute. So again, today, uh, what we're doing is we want to do a little brief introduction to horticultural therapy. We're going to talk about what it is. Uh, also, talk a little bit about the history uh, and some applications and uses. Who could benefit from horticultural therapy? And then as a student, uh, we're going to uh, discuss how I might be able to use horticultural therapy uh, and the training I could receive, and also discuss professional registration. Uh, and so this meeting was sent out to members uh, and also uh, professors at universities that teach horticulture uh, uh, and uh, recreational therapy, uh, occupational therapy, and other allied therapies and, uh, and healthcare professions as a way to introduce students to horticultural therapy. Uh, so we have a wide audience, so I'll try to address uh, some of that as we go throughout the presentation. So first I want to just begin by what is horticultural therapy? Uh, and so you uh, may have read some articles um, for those of you that aren't members of our organization, uh, and you may have seen some different terminology used in different places by different individuals. And so uh, AHDA has uh, two specific definitions related to horticultural therapy, uh, and those are uh, therapy of horticulture, and the other term is horticultural therapy. Sometimes in the media, you might see these different terms interchangeably used, uh, but I want to bring the attention to the differences between those two. So uh, therapy of horticulture, is a participating in horticultural activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist or other professionals with training in the use of horticulture as a therapeutic modality to support programmatic goals. <clears throat> the term horticultural therapy is a participation in horticultural activities facilitated by a registered horticultural therapist to achieve specific goals within an established treatment, rehabilitation, or vocational plan. And so some of the main differences that we see here with these two different de definitions is horticultural therapy tends to be in a healthcare setting, often in a clinical environment. Uh, and therapeutic horticulture is often seen more in community settings with nonprofits uh, and uh, community gardens and other organizations out in the community. Um, it can be led by those who are not registered, but also but have some training in horticulture as therapy. It's also important to note that both of these term terms do include specific goals and objectives that are written based on the population that you're working with to achieve different outcomes based on what you know about the needs, uh, whether uh, they're assessed needs if you're doing horticultural therapy or other information based on those populations. And uh, so one thing just to clarify, and I know this happened, you see this a lot in media, is you see people use the terms like therapy versus therapeutic. Uh, and so I want to kind of introduce that and discuss what that means. Um, and so the, in the essence, therapy is a process that involves professional care or treatment with assessed, with, with assessed needs. It is led by a therapist, so somebody who's trained uh, in, in the using a specific modality and working with clients, versus the term uh, therapeutic, which is a process that has a beneficial effect on the body or mind. And so sometimes... Uh, you may see bumper stickers, particularly I, I think a lot about is someone might have a bumper sticker that says fishing is my therapy or sewing is my therapy or running is my therapy. Uh, and those are kind of fun little bumper stickers, but sometimes 
can cause a little bit of confusion among folks. Uh, and even uh, in a lot of popular media, you, people will use those terms. Uh, and so, you know, therapy obviously has to be led by somebody that is trained therapist and that has set up specific goals and objectives for an individual based on their assessed needs. Uh, and so when we're talking about fishing as a therapy, that's not necessarily the case. Fishing is th can be therapeutic for some people. Uh, selling can be therapeutic for some people. Um, gardening can be therapeutic for many people. But the difference is when I'm outside in a garden and I'm not in a healthcare setting and I'm not working with a trained therapist, uh, I'm doing gardening on my own and I'm getting therapeutic benefits of gardening, whether it's the physical benefits uh, or working with nature. Uh, and, and so that's the difference between that. And so that's why we draw that, that difference. And we, particularly working with the general public, we try to always tell them about those specific differences so they can understand. So um, just a little bit brief history of horticultural therapy. Uh, and, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how, we, how it became uh, a, a profession. Uh, and so we're going to go back in history a little bit, just a brief overview uh, about that. And so some of the things in, in ancient times or in, in, uh, in history, uh, for instance, in Egypt, uh, the royalty in Egypt were often prescribed walks in, in nature or walks in gardens uh, when they felt when they had a mental illness or something. So there's some documentation of that uh, in Europe uh, in, uh, in the ancient times. Uh, monasteries and hospices for individuals often used gardens as a therapeutic tool uh, because there were benefits about being in plant, being around plants. Uh, in the United States, uh, in the 1800s, an uh, individual named Dr. Benjamin Rush worked for the Institute of Medicine and Clinical Practice in Philadelphia, uh, and he noted in some of his writings uh, of some of the individuals at the facility he worked at, they were uh, less manic and, and more relaxed when they were after taking part in a gardening activity. And during that, that time from the 1800s on in the U.S., hospitals uh, and any in the U.S. and Europe began having gardens and, and farming programs as part of their facility. Uh, and so people would use or be outside in, in nature, do gardening, uh, because there were uh, noted or observed benefits uh, <clears throat> related to that. Later on in the United States, uh, one of the notable moments is in 1919, Dr. Miniger and his son uh, uh, created the Miniger Foundation in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> And this facility worked a lot with a lot of unique therapies, including recreational therapy and horticultural therapy, uh, and, and the particular used uh, plants as, and gardens and nature study as a way to help improve the, per, the clients that were part of the program. And another, some other notable moments is um, how, as a profession developed, was after World War I and II, uh, soldiers were coming back injured in hospitals and garden clubs uh, of America uh, would come to the gar uh, come to the hospital facilities and provide plants and activities for uh, the soldiers, and they noted some benefit with those. And all those observations really began leading to the development of the profession. And in 1973, uh, the National Council for Therapy and Re Rehabilitation through Horticulture was formed, and that was the first nonprofit focused on using horticulture as therapy. Um, and that, that organization is now called the American Horticultural Therapy Association. We changed our name in 1988. And we provide a, a variety of uh, services for, for members, uh, including uh, a magazine, an uh, email newsletter, uh, a journal, uh, <coughs> training, excuse me, uh, and some uh, additional information and resources related to the profession. So we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of horticultural therapy. Uh, and there are a lot, some noted benefits in research. And these include things like cognitive benefits. Some examples might be uh, working in, uh, working with uh, different clients that um, the, the using the plants and, and growing the plants and, and helping care for the plants helps improve cognitive functioning of individuals. It also gives individuals the ability to uh, learn about plants, learn things like scientific names and parts of plants and how to care for plants. Um, one of the things I notice a lot when I work at go into facilities is the uh, amount of interest that people are uh, in when we bring our plants in. We bring plants into the room and they start asking questions and they start wanting to know more. And so it, it stimu stimulates individuals' mind uh, and both through the act of 
uh, planting and growing plants, but also learning about plants and caring for those. Social aspect. So gardening can be a very social activity, particularly, uh, and we work, I work in a lot of assisted living facilities. And so this is a time when individuals in the facility get to come together, be part of an activity, oftentimes get to go outside and work in a garden and spend time with each other. Uh, and also, you know, notice that a lot of people, there are garden clubs around the country. And so uh, horticultural therapy provides opportunity for people to work in group settings to uh, learn about horticulture and also receive therapy as part of that. Uh, mood. And so there's research that shows that horticultural therapy helps improve mood, reduce depression, uh, reduce anxiety and stress in individuals that take part in the programs. Uh, motor skills. And so motor skills include fine and gross motor, being able to plant things, uh, being able to walk and go outside and dig in the dirt uh, are, are different skills that they can practice and use in horticultural therapy. Uh, and I mentioned mood and, and also stress and anxiety. So it can reduce stress and improve and reduce anxiety in individuals. <laughs> and then another element is wellness. And so obviously we talk about uh, healthcare and working in healthcare settings, but also horticultural therapy has the ability to help individuals maintain and improve wellness uh, to help incre increase their overall health uh, on an ongoing basis. So populations that can benefit from uh, horticultural therapy uh, are listed here. So I'll talk uh, briefly about some of those. <coughs> Senior citizens, older adults, uh, individuals that live in assisted living facility, memory care facilities uh, have the ability to uh, uh, can benefit from horticultural therapy programs. Many uh, particularly facilities have garden spaces. And so horticultural therapists have the ability to, if they have a job at a, an assisted living facility, or if they go on a contractual basis, uh, they can work with the activity directors and the residents in helping plan uh, and care for and come up with uh, a care plan for, for the garden spaces. Uh, so the residents have the ability to take an active role in managing uh, those courtyard gardens or those gardens that were built as part of their facility. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we find a lot with those individuals is the garden activities really provide a sense of purpose for, for, for residents uh, that live in facilities like assisted living facilities, uh, because it's not just an activity, but it's actually taking ownership of growing and caring for the plants, learning about how to care for them, and then doing that on their own. When Even when the therapist isn't there, uh, they can go out into the courtyard and manage and plant and grow uh, plants on their own. Another population is the individuals with intellectual disabilities, um, veterans, uh, individuals who have experienced PTSD through some kind of trauma um, are, are, are populations that can benefit from horticultural therapy. Uh, individuals who have experienced grief, grief and are processing grief. <clears throat> um, rehabilitation, both physical and mental rehabilitation uh, programs. Hospital patients, um, hospice care uh, and hospice care uh, can include not only the individual that are on, in hospice or on hospice but also the family member and so it provides some opportunities for the family members to uh, process and deal with um, end of life uh, for those loved ones that they care for. The justice system so juvenile justice system prisons and jails <clears throat> often have can have horticultural programs or horticultural therapy programs and what they find is it helps provide job skills, helps improve uh, self-esteem. Uh, and often these programs are for some of the inmates that have uh, demonstrated the ability to um, be safe and uh, be productive and that are not at risk at injuring themselves or others. And so it's sort of a reward for them uh, and also can provide them skills that can later be used once they leave the system and, and get a job. Um, <clears throat> community gardens. Uh, are also some places where horticultural therapists, uh, population, people that live in the community gardens can, can benefit from programming. Children, um, and then obviously, uh, and another one is vocational rehabilitation. So uh, providing training for individuals uh, in horticultural skills uh, and, and vocational skills, and giving them the ability to then go out and get a job and work uh, using the skills that they learned in a program. <laughs> So we're going to talk a little bit about theory and how it works uh, <clears throat> and why it works. And so we're going to talk about some basic theories uh, that, that we utilize and we, we talk about uh, as horticultural therapists. And so one of these uh, is uh, the concept of biophilia. 
uh, and this was developed by E.O. Wilson. And uh, E.O. Wilson noted that the uh, innate emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms and that this innate uh, hereditary is part of the ultimate human nature. And so what, we're, what, we're, what we know is that by we have a connection to animals, plants, and other living things. And as a horticultural therapist, what we're doing is we're taking that connection, we're utilizing the plant, the human plant connections, and we're utilizing that as a therapeutic tool for achieving outcomes and goals for individuals. Another theory uh, we've talked about sometimes with horticultural therapy is this prospect refuge theory. This is developed by Jay Appleton. Appleton. And uh, we noted that uh, this theory discusses uh, things like the prevalence of art and landscape derived from perceptions of what is needed for survival. Uh, and so again, the biophilia and the prospect refuge, we talk some about our experiences uh, as, as humans, and it has in, been ingrained to us of finding places of refuge and safety uh, and garden spaces can provide those. And it can be a, <clears throat> also a place for opportunity or prospect. So opportunity to do things, activities, learn, explore. Uh, and so it has the ability for both of those things. And to note that we as humans tend to identify with natural scenes, natural things like plants and animals. Uh, attention restoration theory uh, by Kaplan and Kaplan. And this involves uh, directed attention, uh, concentration, and indirected, and indirect attention or involuntary attention. And so what this looks at is the, uh, the concept of as, 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 as we get stressed, um, we lose the ability to concentrate and direct our attention on difficult tasks. Good example uh, for those of you who are students is at the end of the semester when all of your professors have all your assignments do, you've got final exams, and so you're getting stressed out studying and trying to complete all these tasks. And as you get more stressed out, things happen to our body. Things like we get more likely to get sick, uh, we might develop depression or other mental health issues, uh, and we have the bit harder time focusing and concentrating on studying and doing the work that needs to get done. And so this theory states that <clears throat> being in nature, uh, and in particular as a horticultural therapist, Working with plants and, and, and dealing with uh, uh, horticultural therapy and, and, and humans and plants has the ability to help restore us by providing a way to reduce our stress uh, and improve our attention. Another way to think of it is, is as we're sick or as we're, we're um, you know, as a human body is designed to respond to stress. And so the initial response is the fight or flight kind of thing. And so our body has the ability to um, change physiologically to manage stress, whether it's to run and run, hide, fight. Uh, and, and our body is meant to go back to that normal status or homeostasis um, at, at, at a certain time. But it, particularly in modern society, what we find is we often uh, have these high levels of stress that go on for longer periods of time uh, for a variety of reasons. And it makes our body wear down and it's not able to readjust. So horticultural therapy is one way to help do that and implement uh, the, the restoration by uh, doing activities related to plants and caring for plants. A couple other research that uh, out there related to, to plants and nature and horticulture um, is uh, Park et al. study uh, mentioned that uh, they worked at uh, working in, with plants and students. And they found that three minutes of plant interac interaction uh, cause relaxation in college students. And so we even at the University of Tennessee have some programs where uh, we do, we work with uh, some residence halls and students and doing some plant activities because we notice and recognize those benefits. Some other studies have found that uh, humans prefer natural scenes. And so what that means is uh, in hospital settings, even placing scenes of nature, scenes of plants around can be helpful uh, in improving uh, an individual's overall wellness and help help them in uh, when they're in need. Uh, another study by uh, Vanderberg uh, looked at <clears throat> guarding uh, for as little as 30 minutes, lowered stress and improved mood. Uh, and so again, uh, it doesn't take hour an hour or full day program, but if you have the ability to do uh, a program for 30 minutes, there are some measured benefits of that. Uh, a couple other studies. Uh, Roger Oreck, 
1984, published a study, uh, View Through Window, uh, and May Influence Recovery. And so what he studied was individuals who had surgery, and he uh, did, uh, measured uh, individuals who had windows that faced trees and plants and individuals that had windows that faced um, buildings or other structures. Uh, <clears throat> and that study found that the individuals were covered quicker who saw the nature, saw plants. And so although that is a passive look at plants, it doesn't, uh, doesn't include what horticultural therapy is, which is the active uh, the active participation in growing plants and caring for plants as therapy, uh, it does show that that is one of the elements that working with plants allows us to see plants and be around nature and benefit from that. <clears throat> some other research uh, related to gardens particularly, but also have some applications as horticultural therapists uh, in, in urban settings. Uh, and so these are some research found that uh, community gardens in, in cities uh, often would find that, uh, see results that there is re often reduction in gun assaults, vandalism, and less stress and more exercise in individuals that lived or surrounded those community gardens. Uh, there are higher levels of, uh, higher levels of neighborhood green space were associated with significant and lower levels of symptomology of depression, anxiety, and stress. Uh, and they also saw an improvement in residents' perceptions of safety in, in, in those urban garden settings or in the communities surrounding those urban gardens. And uh, another, another study or another theory uh, Roger Ork developed was the stress reduction theory. And these are kind of four, four main points of his theory, uh, was the, and particularly dealing with hospital settings, but uh, that gardening can provide uh, a sense of control. Um, often in a hospital, uh, if someone's sick, uh, they are often told, uh, you know, they don't have much choice or control. And so providing uh, the ability to make choices about plants or what they're doing in, in the program can be a way to help in, to provide sense of control to the individual. Uh, social support, uh, obviously working with individuals in group settings uh, and the social interaction. Uh, physical movement, so gardening does provide <coughs> ability to give individual physical movement, whether it's using hand trials or standing and digging or sitting and planting, depending on uh, the individual and their, their, their assessed needs. And then obviously the gardening and the activities and the plants provide a natural distraction for individuals. So just a couple more things. So some of the studies we talked about deal with nature and, hort and some deal with horticulture and gardening. And I wanted to kind of just briefly talk about the kind of what that looks like and what that means. And so nature, uh, it includes the physical world. So plants, animals, landscapes, other features of the earth. Um, horticulture is the cultivation of plants. And so what makes uh, something like nature therapy versus horticultural therapy different is that horticultural therapy involves the planting, growing, caring, and cultivating of plants. Uh, it is the act of growing uh, and tending those plants by the individual that is a therapeutic element that's led by a trained therapist. Um, the, connection of, the connection of the assessed function and clinically defined goals are important uh, related to horticultural therapy, um, and then monitoring progress of those individuals. And it's important to note that, you know, me walking outside into my garden, uh, like I mentioned earlier, or going out to the mountains for a hike is spending time in nature, but it's not a form of active treatment. And so horticultural therapy is a form of active treatment where we are looking at an individual, determining what their, uh, what medical condition they have, determining what their needs are, assessing those, and then coming up with goals and objectives to help meet those needs uh, in, in conjunction with medical doctors and the medical team that, they, that you're working with and then doing the horticultural activities and as a way to meet those specific goals and objectives. Um, I did have a video uh, <clears throat> that uh, we had uh, shared uh, in the email link. Uh, this is a, a marketing video that gives a little information about uh, AHTA. It's just a little short uh, three minute video. I'm gonna run that real quick uh, and see if I can get that to load.
Sorry, it's, uh, I just got a note that the video wasn't working. Um, so what I'll do is I will put that in the, it's on, it is located on, um, our, uh, it'll be on the slide. So you can uh, check on that later. So we don't uh, spend any more time for that. Apologize for that. A uh, little technical difficulty with the video, uh, but uh, it is on our AHTA YouTube channel. So you can uh, just look that up. Uh, also uh, after the call, if you want to learn, uh, watch that video. Again, it's a great video, highlights one of our, the programs uh, that of uh, horticultural therapy programs and some photos from others from around the country. <clears throat> so uh, again, one of the, the reasons for doing this workshop was to try to introduce students to horticultural therapy. And we're gonna talk about jobs and where jobs are. And uh, horticultural therapy does not have a specific job category from the Bureau of Labor Statistics right now. Um, But, uh, and so that becomes challenging as far as identifying how many jobs are out there. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little about some jobs that, I, that are showing up that I found and talk about what to do and how to look for jobs. Uh, but uh, there are different places you might work if somebody does want to become a horticultural therapist. And so those can include botanical gardens. I work at the University of Tennessee Gardens. Uh, so we developed our horticultural therapy program there and I also teach uh, now. And so there are other horticultural therapists around the country that work at some of, some of the, the great botanical gardens we have throughout the country. Hospitals or healthcare systems, uh, long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, memory care facilities, uh, the Veterans Administration. I know several therapists that work at VAs or hospitals around the country. Nonprofits that serve a variety of clients. <coughs> Greenhouse and horticulture focused businesses. Uh, may hire horticultural therapists for helping with training and working with individuals with disabilities. Self-employment. And so many uh, therapists, uh, horticultural therapists, end up going into business and creating their own job and their own business and do consulting work and contractor work with different individuals. So maybe a facility can't afford to hire somebody for full time, but they have some funds to hire a contractor or hire somebody to come in and do some programming. And so that's how, uh, how sometimes horticultural therapists will run a business, uh, and then as the, the group has more funds, uh, they might end up hiring them full-time also. And any organization really that has garden spaces and serves unique populations could hire uh, and employ horticultural therapists around the country. So these are some job openings for the throughout the year that I've been seeing this last year. So some of them are, are have been posted and are no longer uh, They've already hired somebody, they've taken them down. So, and this is just a simple search I did on Indeed uh, and uh, ZipRecruiter. Uh, and so, and I used this, I just typed in horticultural therapy. So you could be, if you're looking for jobs after becoming trained as a horticultural therapist, you know, these are some places to look. Networking obviously is really important for job development and finding, finding an employer, but also doing some searches. So terms like horticultural therapy, uh, Therapy, horticulture, garden therapy, gardening therapy. Some of those are key words, kind of like if you're doing a, a, a research project and you're trying to find research studies, you might use some key words like that. So gardening and horticulture and therapy and therapist. Uh, and you could do some different searches and find some, some positions. These are some that I found. Uh, one, and these are just the job titles and kind of where they were. <clears throat> some of them might still be hiring. I didn't look specifically at the date of posting of these, uh, but horticultural therapist was one job for a group called Endeavors in Texas. Um, the uh, gardening wellness, garden wellness coordinator in Well Power uh, in uh, Colorado, uh, clinical coordinator in uh, Project Renewal in New York, uh, education director uh, Bullington Gardens uh, in North Carolina. Uh, they, uh, I know they, um, the director there had just retired, and they have replaced that position has been filled, I believe. So, um, garden workshop instructor, Horticultural Society of New York actually had several positions open this year uh, that they filled or are in the process of filling. Care farmer uh, in this group in Alaska, uh, rehabilitation therapist in Florida, activity therapist uh, in South Carolina, field therapist in Pacific Quest. I know they have, Pacific Quest is a, a great program in Hawaii where they have had several horticultural therapists over the years working there. Horticultural coordinator, uh, Hillside in Georgia, child care teacher, lead provider, special kids, special families in Colorado, and then activity therapist in Georgia. And one of the things you'll note is when you do a search like this and you'll find some different, different job titles and you wonder if they fit what you're looking for, 
you want to look in the description of uh, qualifications. And so some of these, for instance, might be uh, somebody that's a rec therapist. They might be looking for somebody that's a certified therapeutic rec specialist also. But then they'll also state there that they would like somebody that's registered uh, as a horticultural therapist through AHTA. So, or <clears throat> they may just mention the job description. Uh, so some like these garden work, um, like the care farmer ecotherapy in Alaska, they did say that they were wanting somebody who has experience in, in horticultural therapy to implement the program. So you can do a keyword search. You can find some jobs that might match. Start looking through the job description and saying, okay, what are the skills they're looking for? Uh, do I have those skills? Do I have the training? And then is it a good fit for me to apply? And then you can reach out and apply. <coughs> I'm going to go in now to a little bit about education uh, with uh, horticultural therapy if you do, uh, and, and professional registration. So right now, AHTA has uh, accredited horticultural therapy certificate programs. Uh, and so these are programs that are college level educational uh, programs that offers equivalent of nine hour semester credits in horticultural therapy. They're accredited by AHTA, and these provide the foundation and theory and application of horticultural therapy for diverse populations. So currently, uh, there are uh, several uh, accredited programs that are accepting students, and so these are the ones that are currently accepting students. Uh, Delaware Valley University Horticultural Therapy Institute, uh, Rutgers uh, State University of New Jersey, Temple University, uh, University of Florida, uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, and if you go to our website at aHTA.org and check out uh, education, it can list you it will list out some more additional information about those programs. And so some of the questions <coughs> are why would I want to take horticultural therapy coursework? And uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. <coughs> One, it, the, this horticultural therapy coursework pre prepares you to become professionally registered as a horticultural therapist. Also, it can give you skills and training to work with diverse populations. So these are some examples um, that I've experienced. Even as somebody that may be a horticulturist, uh, someone that's working in horticulture, you may get a job working in a setting that hires and employs people with disabilities. And so you having some training in horticultural therapy could be a great skill set to sell and promote uh, as you're hi getting hired by the, that organization. Another way is you might come across visitors or program participants. Let's say if you're a garden educator who have a disability or health condition. Uh, I, we run a summer camp programs. And over the years, I've had some individuals, uh, students who are on the autism spectrum who have come to our program. So it wasn't specific horticultural therapy, but the training that I had in horticultural therapy helped me be, be able to better meet the needs of that individual who was coming in uh, to our program. <clears throat> it can enhance programs already at your facility that you may work at. So for instance, if you uh, work at a greenhouse program that has a local nonprofit, uh, of a no not local nonprofit that serves people with intellectual disabilities, getting additional training in horticultural therapy can help you with your program development and help increase the ability to have better programs and measure and better outcomes for those participants you work for. Could give you tools as a therapist, counselor, or practitioner to use horticulture as a therapeutic intervention. Um, as an allied health professional, horticulture has been shown to help many different populations that you serve. I came into this profession, I was a certified therapeutic recreation specialist, and I went back to school and got additional work coursework and did an additional internship. So I've become professionally registered and enhanced the training I already had as a, as a CTRS. So professional registration. So we do have a professional registration system is Horticultural Therapist Registered or HTR. <clears throat> so we are, uh, HTA is the only organization in the United States that registers horticultural therapists. Uh, we are the preferred provider of horticultural therapy and therapeutic horticultural interventions. This, uh, this designation helps show that the individuals have met industry standards of education and training. And some more information and uh, details about professional registration can be found online at ahta.org slash professional hyphen registration. And again, we have our policies and procedures on there that you, uh, if you're interested, you can go back and look at more details about that. I'm going to talk specifically about a few elements related to professional registration before we finish up today. So the requirements. So our minimum requirement is a you must have a bachelor's degree. Uh, with a concentration in horticultural therapy or a bachelor's degree with an additional coursework 
that meets the academic required as noted in our professional registration policies and procedures. So you have to have a bachelor's degree uh, and then have successfully completed a 480 hour internship in horticultural therapy uh, supervised by an HTR <coughs> or equivalent work experience. There's an application fee for that. You also, as you apply, you would need to be a member of AHTA at the time of application of an associate level one or associate level two, year two. So the bachelor's degree. So it can't, the bachelor's degree doesn't have to be just in horticulture or horticultural therapy. Uh, I, I, again, I had a bachelor's, uh, my bachelor's degree was in outdoor recreation. I have a master's degree in therapeutic recreation uh, and I applied using that master's degree and the training that I had. An advanced degree can also be accepted in horticulture or human science field. Uh, and that could also uh, help fulfill the undergraduate requirements for professional registration. Uh, when we're talking about college coursework, you do have to have a, a great passing grade of C uh, minus or above uh, for a passing grade. And then also we're looking for uh, a degree, a, a additional coursework that you might need to have. So one is the uh, nine credit hours of horticultural therapy, which you can receive through uh, the um, <clears throat> accredited uh, horticultural therapy programs certificate programs. Uh, and then you also have to have 12 uh, hours, credit hours of plant science, 12 hours of F uh, human science. So in education, again, we mentioned a bachelor's degree with horticulture or concentration in horticultural therapy, an equivalent bachelor's degree, or a master's or doctor in plant science or hu a human science field. I'm going to talk now specifically about the course content. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, we talked about uh, the horticultural therapy coursework. We're going to talk now about the plant science coursework. So you would need 12 semester credits in horticulture, or I'm sorry, in plant science. And so there's three main core courses we're looking for. One is introduction to horticulture. Uh, the other one is plant propagation. And the third one is pest and disease plant management or integrated pest management. You also would need one elective, uh, a minimum of three semester credits in one of the subject areas below. Plant pathology, greenhouse production management, nursery production management, landscape design, plant materials, or soils. And then human science. You need 12 semester credits in human science. And those core courses, uh, three core courses, which include general psychology, abnormal psychology, human development through the lifespan, and then one elective uh, of the list below, counseling theories, uh, aspects of disabilities and illnesses, group dynamics, principles of therapy, human anatomy and physiology, or adult development aging. And so talking about this, and we mentioned the higher level training, as a, a when I was receiving my uh, master's degree in, in therapeutic recreation, uh, I didn't have to necessarily uh, cert get certified as a, a recreational therapist uh, to get a master's degree. I could have gone and not taken additional coursework uh, to, to be certified, but I chose to do that because I did want to become certified. Um, and these courses that I took for my uh, certification included psychology, th these courses that are listed here. Uh, and so those are all undergraduate courses. So I had to, while I was working on my master's degree, also go back and take the undergraduate coursework to qualify for that. So that's something, you know, some questions you might have, uh, you know, tends to be these are uh, undergraduate courses, but um, <clears throat> you can find a lot of these courses at most universities around the country. And then the other required course uh, work, so we've talked about plant science, we've talked about human science, and now horticultural therapy. And so nine semester credits totaling in, in horticultural therapy. Uh, the certificate programs are set up, and they uh, you can look at those on, online to get the specifics of each one. But you're looking at information and topic areas, including horticultural therapy overview, the introduction, fundamentals of horticultural therapy, horticultural therapy program management, um, horticultural therapy skills, techniques, or practice, horticultural therapy methods and programming, human issues in horticultural therapy, and people-parent relationships. Some course titles uh, may vary uh, depending on program, but these are some course titles uh, that you might see out there for these. So introduction to horticultural therapy, horticultural therapy programming techniques, uh, or horticultural therapy program management. We mentioned the internship. And so there is a supervised internship requirement for professional registration, which includes, uh, it's a 480 hour internship. So I was already certified as a therapeutic recreation specialist. I did a, um, I did a four or 500 hour internship for that at the time. 
Uh, now CTRSs have to do a 560 hour internship, I believe. So I, after completing my horticultural therapy coursework and plant science coursework, I had to take a, I had to do another internship supervised by an HGR. Uh, and there's three kind of options that you can do with this. Uh, and one of those is on site. And so that obviously is the most ideal of, of finding somebody that's a horticultural therapist that has an internship site where you could come and work with them and do your 480 hours. Uh, however, uh, one of the challenges is there are um, geographic diversity of our, our HTRs. And so we have two other options. One is offsite. And that is, let's say you work at a, uh, <coughs> a facility and you want to do horticultural therapy there, uh, but there isn't an HTR and you want to do internship there. So what that would be is you would need to find an HGR that is uh, able to supervise you and they would offsite supervise. So they would be able to, they, what they have to do under the requirements is visit uh, you at the facility uh, a minimum of three times during your 480 hours, usually at the beginning, middle and end. Uh, they can come additional times to do that. My internship was done offsite. And so I had a HGR that came and visited me while I was doing my internship. Uh, and then there's the online option. And the online option is uh, very much using some system like Zoom, doing online. Uh, and this is where uh, the horticultural therapist might not be able to travel to your site. Uh, maybe uh, there's no one around within several hours driving you and someone doesn't have the ability to come do that. So that's the online option. Um, a couple other things about the online option. Uh, we do, before you start the online internship, you do need to be approved by AHJ to do that, which means you have to have all of your coursework your plant science, your human science, and horticultural therapy coursework completed before you can begin the online format. Alternative. So there is an alternative to the internship, and this would be work experience. Uh, I have a colleague that just became registered, and they used the alternative work experience option. And so this is where an applicant can uh, would not have to do the internship if they have an equivalent of 2,000 hours of work experience uh, within a two-year period. Uh, that is directly supervised by a registered horticultural therapist. And so then we'd have to document that uh, and have a letter from your employer verifying uh, that, that you were able to do that work experience. So again, uh, we mentioned professional registration policies and procedures. It's a lengthy document. There's a lot of information there. Uh, we don't have uh, the ability to go over that here. But I do want to state that it is located on our website under professional registration. So go back and check that out. Just a couple more things and then we have some time for some questions. And so why would you want to pursue professional registration? Uh, and there's several reasons. It can, one, enhance your current training and professional credentials. Uh, it can set you apart from other job applicants. Uh, it helps illustrate that you have uh, the industry standards and training. Uh, coursework could be used for continuing education for other healthcare professions. So I use my horticultural therapy courses that I took as continuing education for my CTRS. So that was great. It, it helped me uh, continue do do my continuing education uh, and saved a little money there on the side. It helps illustrate to clients, customers, and the public your commitment to training and professional recognition. So some next steps. Uh, I, I know, and I know I presented a lot of information. Um, so you can, I think it's one thing that's important to know to like, share, subscribe to our social media accounts. We have Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, uh, and uh, Twitter. So uh, check those out um, uh, and, and follow those. It's a great way to network, ask questions, learn, see what else is going on. Uh, become a member if you're not already. Uh, so as, as a member, uh, if you go to our website, you can sign up. Uh, but we're also looking for volunteers to work on work teams to help with uh, tasks that need to be done as uh, an organization to help propel our profession forward. Uh, as a member, it gives you the opportunity to network with others, ask questions and learn from other professionals. Uh, you have access to the member directory so you can look up in professionals that maybe live in your area or those that are uh, study a certain uh, have a field of study or work with a certain population. You can email them and, and communicate with them about how they do their programming. Uh, as a student, if you're a student, consider a research project related to horticultural therapy. Um, conduct research and submit to the Journal of Therapeutic Horticulture. Uh, consider submitting an article idea for our newsletter or our magazine uh, about a project you're working on. Uh, seek out professional registration. 
and then also be on the lookout. We've got more community meetings coming up. Uh, we have uh, throughout the next few months, uh, we'll be doing some, uh, again, ways to continue to connect members and individuals interested in horticultural therapy. So we'll take just a minute for a few questions if you have any, so you can put those in the chat. Uh, we will try to answer those as best as possible within our time. Uh, but if you do have additional questions or if you uh, want to get involved and don't know where to start or if you're interested in professional registration, send us an email to at info at AHTA.org and we will respond to you uh, and give you uh, help answer those questions and help give you some guidance. So now we just have some time for questions. If you have any, uh, again, uh, if you want to put those in the chat, uh, that would be great. So I'm going to start looking at those real quick. And so one question is a therapeutic horticulture program model acceptable during the internship? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, I think the question is important to note is, are you working with a supervisor that is a HTR, a horticultural therapist registered? If you are, then that model is acceptable. If you are working with somebody that is not professionally registered with AHTA, that would not count uh, unless you find an HTR to do an offsite or online supervision for you with that. Uh, another question is, uh, is an associate's in horticulture along with a bachelor's in English enough uh, to go into HT coursework? And I would say yes. And so, uh, you know, you could, we have students that start by doing the horticultural therapy coursework first, uh, and it just depends. So with your bachelor's degree, that's that minimum uh, in English. <clears throat> and then you have some horticulture courses as an associate. Uh, and so you, you could also, so yeah, I think that would be a good beginning point if you're looking for developing or going into horticultural therapy. Uh, and so you can look at our accredited programs and uh, see which one might fit your needs. We have programs that are all online. We have some that are online hybrid. We have some that are all in person. And so uh, look at you know where you're going, um, contact all those facilities, ask them questions about their programs so you can see which one might fit your needs the best. But I think that is an excellent start if you are looking at becoming uh, a horticultural therapist. Okay, this one is in terms of the internships, the on-site option as well as work experience will involve the applicant being paid for the work. Do the off-site and online internships involve intern paying the HDR? So that's a good question. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> there are some internships that are out there that do have, that may pay. Uh, there are also some that are volunteer. I also supervise therapeutic recreation students from UT. Uh, they're, uh, it's an unpaid uh, internship, mostly because my program doesn't have the funds to pay them. If I had the money, I would do that. Um, I know a, a program in North Carolina has an internship program and they provide housing for the individual uh, to, while they're doing the internship. And there may be others that pay. Um, so there, there is a variety of those. Um, <clears throat> now, the qu other question is, uh, do the offsite and online internships involve the intern paying the HTR? And so uh, we don't have a specific policy saying that that is not allowed. Um, some HTRs might ask for, say, travel expenses, um, but we don't uh, have a specific statement of that. Uh, that would be up to the, the that would be the a discussion that you would need to have with an HTR that would be supervising you. And so I had uh, my supervisor who came and traveled, uh, had a place to stay. Uh, and because they wanted to give back to the profession and continue the profession growing, they didn't charge me to do that. Uh, and I supervise interns and I don't charge a fee for that. Um, there are other healthcare models where like licensed clinical people do, cha do charge. And so some people uh, in other parts of the country kind of expect that, uh, but it is not uh, necessarily uh, expected as a horticultural therapy intern supervisor. So that would be a question you would want to ask the supervisor you're, you're reaching out to. All right, so can you clarify work experience with direct supervision versus internship where you have a supervisor visit you three times per year? So <clears throat> the, the, the work experience uh, option only works if you are working underneath full-time uh, or part-time, uh, you know, up to 2,000 hours within two years, you would be working directly at a facility. So, like, if I were hire you, would hire you to work at the University of Tennessee, um, you could get that work experience as instead of an internship. If you're doing an internship, uh, like an off-site internship, 
that's because you would not be working directly at paid by somebody. So this, uh, so uh, I think, I hope that clarifies. So again, the direct, that work experience deals with you being employed by somebody that's a registered horticultural therapist as your super, direct supervisor versus the internship uh, you would maybe, you, you would not be necessarily employed by in person, but you would be an intern, which was often a volunteer experience. All right, um, I think we've got a, got a few more I'm going to try to get through. We've got a few more minutes. <coughs> I have a 30 credit certificate in production horticulture from a local community college. None of the courses are called intro to hort, plant prop, or pest management, but the content is there. Are there exceptions to classes? Uh, and I want to avoid taking those. So um, there are, there has, um, so right now, HGA does not have a pre-approval process for horticulture or for horticultural, the plant science or the human science coursework. Uh, however, I'm going to share my screen uh, and talk about how you can look and see if it'll work. Uh, and so there are uh, at times when the course, the course title doesn't match up. And what we're looking for is the con the con course content. So I'm going to go back to my screen real quick and share a link and talk about what you would be looking for. So this will be on the AHTA website. And if you go to professional registration and click on that, it'll take you to this information about professional registration. And then you would go down below and you would see uh, a, a a file that says course titles that support AHGA core curriculum topic areas. When you click on that, that'll come up with uh, the course titles and course content and example of course titles. So when you're talking about your, your 30 hour certificate or the 30 hour coursework that you had, this is what you would need to do. You would need to be able to provide um, the course title, uh, a course description and a course syllabus because it doesn't match the course title. So, and then uh, they would review, the review board would review that to see if it has this content. So for introduction to horticulture, uh, this middle column is what you would need to have in there. So introduction to horticultural crops, understanding environmental factors uh, in production of horticultural crops, overview of plant sciences, horticultural practices, careers in horticulture, some other course titles that might work that, have worked or that would also do this introduction of horticulture, uh, horticultural, horticultural science, general horticulture. So this is where you would need to go look uh, and then look at your syllabus and, and see if you have everything. And so uh, you, with that program, you might, uh, but I would have to, you would have to have that reviewed. We are developing a pre-approval process for folks that, um, that won't be available till sometime next year. So we have a task force that is reviewing how to do this, other professionals do this, where say somebody is like, I find a course, I'm interested in it, um, will it work? And so then there'll be a process to do and we would pre-approve that. Uh, so you would either, if you found a course at a university that you think about taking, or for, for your example of the question you had, you might be able to uh, apply that way and then before you go about taking additional courses. I'm gonna go back and try to answer a few more questions. <clears throat> Will there be an accreditation exam as part of the HGR requirement? Right now, uh, we last year or this year, we finished our third job analysis. And one of the next steps in the professional development process is to seek out developing uh, a certification exam. Uh, so at this time, there is not an exam. Uh, and that process, uh, we are working on taking the feedback from the job analysis and making some decisions about when and where to go do that. That has been one of the goals of the organization to develop an exam, but that exam does not exist at the time, at this time. All right, is it possible to earn your, is it possible to intern at your current job during your work hours and be supervised by an HTR for your internship? your intern supervisor would not be employed. So that is possible. Um, I'm actually working with some individuals like right now, trying to work on that process, doing an online format like that. A couple of challenges we're running into are, you have to have all the coursework. Um, that, that's not a major one. The other one is uh, that this is kind of new to facilities. So 
you do have to do have uh, somebody there as a supervisor because if I'm not there, um, I can't manage to make sure you're following the organization's policies and procedures. So, <clears throat> and, but if you have a supervisor that is uh, licensed or credentialed in some other healthcare field, and they are you, they're willing to let you do your internship or let you develop programs. Uh, that is a possibility of a way that you could do your internship. So you would, may not have to move, and we just have to develop. You'd have to find an internship supervisor that'd be willing to do that, whether online or offsite. And so then they would, you know, preferably if you had somebody in your city that they would be willing to come and visit you throughout the, the program, that'd be a great way to do it. Or an online one where we would have to figure out uh, some things we'd have to work out <clears throat> would be things like uh, confidentiality, HIPAA, how do we work that through? And that's where discussions with your organ your site that you work at and the internship HTR supervisor would have to work out how that would look, and but that is possible. So once again, thank you all for attending tonight, and I hope you all have a great rest of your night.